When I was in high school, I grew up in a place called West Virginia. Uh, that's a state. How many of you guys know where West Virginia is? Okay, how many of you guys know that that's not West Virginia? That's actually West Virginia? Uh, that's what I thought. So, so it turns out this is West Virginia. Uh, this is where I grew up. And, and for those of you that are unaware, it's a beautiful state. You should all go visit it. The mountains are just amazing. Um, it, it's kind of like a, the best kept secret. And people that live there like to keep it that way because no tourists and things coming in and visiting all the time. But it's a beautiful state you should go and visit. Now, I loved growing up in West Virginia. And, and I should really start by, by making the point that I grew up in a really great family. And these are my parents, Rocky and Sheila. Uh, and they're probably the most supportive people that I've ever encountered in my life. And I hope every single one of you has somebody in your life that's supportive like they were to me. That could be a teacher, it could be your parents, it could be a grandparent, it could be anybody. But I hope somebody has, uh, every one of you has somebody like this in your life. Now, I have to say though, when I was a little kid, I always told my parents I wanted to be a scientist. And to me, that meant being a boy in the lab for the FBI. And I always said that's what I wanted to be. I, I had no idea what that meant. But I knew I wanted to be a scientist, and that was the only frame of reference I had. Now, the problem came in from the fact that he is a band director. She is a band director. And in fact, my mom, my sister, my, my brother-in-law, they're all musicians and band directors. Nobody had any idea how to pursue a career in science. And so in a lot of ways, I, I stumbled through this career in a lot of, a lot of <laughs> with the help from a lot of different people who I'll highlight along the way, uh, but basically always with the support of my parents. And that was something that was really important. And again, I hope you guys all have people like that in your life. So the first thing I had to do was figure out what I wanted to do when I went to college. So I graduated high school. Turns out I really loved science. I knew I wanted to be a scientist, or I thought I did. Uh, and so basically I had to find out, what does that mean? What do you do when you go to college to become a scientist? And so what I realized was, well, science, I, I guess that's chemistry. That's the thing I did the most in high school. It's the thing I seemed to be uh, best at in high school. And we had a really good chemistry teacher in high school. So chemistry was I was going to pursue when I went to college. So I looked at a different, bunch of different colleges in the area, uh, and the one that really seemed to have a good chemistry program that was close and something I really seemed to be uh, uh, enjoyable with was in the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. So basically, uh, this is more or less the, uh, um, uh, the place where I pursued my, my chemistry education. So at UVA, I, I, I started taking chemistry classes. And the first ones are pretty similar to what you have in high school in AP chemistry and things like that. You learn a lot about basics of acids and bases and those sorts of reactions. But it wasn't really to my second year of college where I started to really appreciate what type of chemistry I really enjoyed. And that was this type of chemistry called organic chemistry, which I'm sure many of you guys are aware of, is the chemistry of carbon cations, basically the chemistry of life in a lot of ways. And I loved this. I, I know you guys hear horror stories about organic chemistry, but I thought it was amazing. Basically, what you get to do is you get to take all kinds of different molecules, all kinds of different shapes. And if you learn how they interact with each other, and you learn how to sort of help them interact with each other and react with each other, you can build complex structures doing this. And I, I thought this was awesome. And it was all about understanding the rules and having a puzzle and how you put everything together. And to me, that just really fit with everything I really thought about science and what I really wanted to pursue uh, for my own career. I just loved what you could do with it. So after I realized that I like organic chemistry, the question was, how do you do this? It's one thing to actually learn about it in a classroom and read it in a book. Even in lab courses in college, it, it, it's one thing to do that. It's a whole nother to actually get experience working in a lab. And I realized that to figure out if I wanted to do this or not, I had to actually get in the lab. I had to start participating. I had to do the work. You, I can watch soccer till I'm blue in the face, but at the end of the day, the way to actually know if you want to be a soccer player is you play soccer. So to me, that was the big, the big step. And so I started going to a bunch of different labs and asking, can I work in your lab? I'm an undergraduate. I'd love to do this. And they'd look at me and say, no, no, I don't think so. And so I'd move on to the next one. I just kept going down the line until finally I ran into one woman, uh, Professor Felicia Etzkorn, who let me work in her lab. Now, uh, this was a big moment for me, and one I, I'm always going to appreciative for her. Uh, this, she's now at Virginia Tech, but at the time she was at UVA in the Department of Chemistry. And she was the first person to really take a chance on me and actually let me come into her group and see what it's like to really be a scientist. Now, at the time, uh, she was working on this project where she basically tried to, uh, that really involved this one step. When you take this type of a molecule, convert it to this type of molecule. And it doesn't really matter what that is. Don't worry about that so much. But there's an enzyme or a protein that basically lets this type of molecule go to that type of molecule. And it's a protein called PIN1. And it's a type of protein called a peptidoproloisomerase. So that means it converts these types of prolines to those types of prolines. But again, it doesn't matter about the details in this point. The reason why it was really cool is because PIN1 activity is increased in cancer. Lots of different types of cancer. 
And so her goal was to develop small molecules or drugs that basically can inhibit PIN1 as a potential treatment for cancer. And that was something I thought was really cool, right? So you, ha you get to make molecules that you have a real biological outcome and you can see how they're gonna work. So there's a lot of chemistry going on in her lab, and this is some, one of the reactions uh, that I did a little bit of work on at one point. Um, I didn't actually contribute anything to this. It was worked out by other people, but I got to do some of these, and that was kind of fun. And I really enjoyed it. I, I mean, I got to get my hands dirty. I got to actually do these reactions. Now, unfortunately, that ended up with some problems. I started some fires, um, which probably was a good indication that this may not be the type of science for me. Uh, but nonetheless, I powered through, uh, and, and I really wanted to study organic chemistry moving forward. So this really was the first opportunity I had to be in a lab, to be scientific and be actual doing experiments. And in a lot of ways, my education at UVA, the one main lesson, the one thing I really learned about this is that you need to get in a lab. Research experience is invaluable. If you want to be a scientist, get in a lab, do stuff. It doesn't matter if that's what you do forever, just get in a lab and learn how it all works. And, and honestly, I will be forever grateful to Professor Escorn for taking a chance on me, uh, more so than she'll ever really know. And I'm really appreciative for this, and I think about this a lot. Now, one thing I want to highlight, though, is that there's lots of opportunities even for high school students to work in labs. Scripps, for example, has an internship program where high school students come in and they work in my group, or other groups, I should say. Uh, and, and we've had multiple come into our group to work in my lab, and they've been fantastic. Some of them actually have stayed on. They've actually stayed and they work in my lab other summers during their undergraduate as well. Other ones have stayed on as technicians working in my lab. It's a great opportunity for you guys. And it's not just Scripps. All these different institutions around, companies too, have these types of internship programs. So if you can't do it as a high school student, do it as an undergraduate. Get in the lab as soon as you can if you want to be a scientist. Go do science. Sometimes it doesn't matter even what that type of science is. You can worry about that later, but just get experience. That's a real important lesson that all of you guys should know if you want to pursue this type of career. At this stage in my career, um, it was time for me to make the next decision. What's the next step? I, I have an undergraduate degree in chemistry. What comes next? And it turns out that, that the next step typically is to go get a postgraduate degree. And in most cases, that means a PhD. So when you apply for a PhD program, which is at other institutions, you apply to the institutions. So effectively, you need to figure out what sorts of places are doing the type of science you want to do. So that means MIT is doing a certain type of science in general, and, and Berkeley and Harvard are doing different types of science. And so you basically go to visit these places and you figure out who's actually doing the type of work I want to do. And when you look for these institutions, you don't look for a single lab. You look for a bunch of different labs all doing the type of work you're interested in. And to me, it was really clear when I visited all these different places that the place for me was the Scripps Research Institute. Now, at the time, Scripps had this fantastic sort of group of people, and they still do, I shouldn't say at the time, they still have this fantastic group of people doing a field of study called chemical biology. And what that means is they make compounds, but then they apply them to, to biological problems like amyloid diseases, cancers, diabetes. They, they basically make the compounds and then they use them and show how they can work and show how you can actually employ them to real biological discoveries. And there were lots of groups doing this. And I, and I was really just blown away when I came and visited as an undergrad. It was just such an awesome place to come and see. The collaborations, everything that was going on here was just phenomenal. But there was one lab in particular I was really excited about. And that's the lab of Jeff Kelly. This is me and Jeff back in 2005. And, and I just honestly, when I came and visited him first, it was amazing to me how, how, what cool stuff he was doing. Now, to talk about Jeff and his work and the work I did as, an under, as, a, as a grad student, we have to take a step back a little bit. I have to talk a little bit about proteins and what proteins are uh, and, and how proteins can be bad, effectively. So proteins come from the central dogma of biology. And this is something you guys have probably already know. Uh, but basically, it's more or less how you convert genetic information into functional products. And it starts with DNA. DNA is the basic blueprint of life where effectively it, DNA itself is, encodes all the genetic information that you can use to, to function as a, as, as a living being. Now, DNA itself gets transcribed, which means it gets converted into a different type of nucleotide, and that's called RNA. Now, RNA itself basically is the message. DNA is the blueprint that tells RNA to be made, and that says make a certain type of protein. So the RNA itself gets translated into a polypeptide that looks like this. Okay? This is basically what makes up proteins. So what proteins actually are is a sequence of amino acids. And amino acids are basically the building blocks of proteins. And there are 21 or 20 amino acids, and I'm including an extra one here, selenocysteine. But basically, it's a series of amino acids that have all different kinds of shapes and, and all different kinds of properties. 
for example, we have some that basically have charges. These are the positively charged ones. These are the negatively charged ones. You have some that are real greasy. The ones down here are real greasy. They look like oil, effectively. They, they like to uh, uh, um, work in that sort of way. And some that are sort of variations of those two. There's lots of different flavors of these. So what ends up happening is the RNA encodes a series of amino acids that basically come out in a certain order. And they're all connected exactly the same way. But you can change the order, and you can change the protein itself. Okay? So you have these amino acids that form this polypeptide that form the protein. All different types of amino acid sequences are associated with this. Now what's amazing about this is when you think about the protein itself, it's not linear. It's not this sort of long, skinny thing. It's actually a really complex structure. And in fact, this is sort of an example of how this looks. This is actually a structure that was uh, solved uh, by Mia and working with another grad student, Christina. Uh, um, and basically, you can see how complicated these proteins are. That one polypeptide chain compacts on itself, effectively, to make really complicated looking things. And here you can see there's little curly cues. These are called helices, formed by different amino acids, about four of them per turn or so. And then you have sheets in the back here, these two little strands together. They actually form a different sort of structure. I mean, this is a really complicated thing coming from that one sequence of amino acids. And this isn't it. They can have all other kinds of shapes as well. They can be long, they can be compact, they can be huge like virus capsids, they can be sort of more compact and sort of distinct structures. These things come in all different shapes and it all comes from the same set of amino acids organized in a very specific sequence with the same sort of connections between them. And I found that to be really pretty amazing when it comes down to it. That, that one set of 21 things can come together into this linear polypeptide to form all these different types of structures. I found that to be just amazing. Now one thing I should mention is, in order for all these proteins to perform all the biological activity in your body, they have to adopt these conformations. They have to be these sorts of structures. In other words, if you have just a sequence of amino acids that don't do anything, these sorts of compact, complicated structures are what's actually doing all the biology uh, inside of our, our bodies. So then the question becomes, how do you go from being a linear chain of amino acids to a complex structure like these? So the short answer is there's a process called protein folding. And protein folding is really something that is critical for all proteins to adopt these complex structures. Now, the way this generally works, and this is a really simplified version of this, is that like amino acids like to go to like amino acids. So in this case, I have two different types of amino acids to make it real simple. And basically, the white amino acids and the black amino acids, all the black ones are the greasy ones. They like to actually go together, and they actually form this sort of core in the middle of this protein, where all the black amino acids are together, because they like to be together. And so by doing this, you can see by, by the organization of how they're organized throughout this sequence, you can actually get a compact structure out of this, right? So effectively, this is how protein folding works. It's not just greasy things like greasy things. It's like negative things like positive charge things. They can come together and form for interactions that help stabilize these conformations. So you have to be able to go from this, this linear chain to this compact structure. That's protein folding. Now, it shouldn't surprise you because I told you that, that proteins have to fold to function. They have to do all these biological activities in your body, and they have to have these structures to do it. So it shouldn't surprise you that our bodies are really, really good at getting from amino acids to compact structures. We're good at that. However, there are examples where this doesn't work out quite so well. And that's basically called protein misfolding, where it doesn't quite get to the right conformation. It doesn't quite get where it needs to be. And so this can uh, come from a number of different sorts of, of things. This can come from heat. So basically, if, if the body gets too hot, it can induce protein misfolding. It can come from environmental toxins. Like if you drink arsenite, for example, it would actually cause protein folding. There are genetic mutations. So mutations where basically one of your amino acids in this, a certain protein can make it much more difficult to attain the proper conformation. Now, when you talk about misfolding too, it doesn't have to be a huge difference. This is looking at the example of a misfolded protein where you can see they look pretty similar. They're just subtle little differences between these structures that means this one is not sort of folded properly and not as functional, okay? Now, the problem with misfolded proteins is that they have a tendency to clump together. And this clumping together uh, results in the formation of big oligomers and, and fibrils. And these are basically big clumps of protein that are sticking together and forming uh, uh, different sorts of toxic species. Now, misfolded proteins, when they aggregate, they can, they're really associated with a class of diseases called amyloid diseases. And that's really characterized by the deposition of these clumps of proteins, and specifically these amyloid fibrils, which have a very specific type of structure and, and clumping uh, association uh, in their diseases. And you've heard of amyloid diseases, whether you know it or not. Uh, a great example of this is Alzheimer's disease. That's an amyloid disease. Parkinson's disease, that's an amyloid disease. 
Huntington's disease, that's an amyloid disease. So there are lots of different types of diseases that have these same sorts of aggregates. Now what's really amazing about this is all different types of proteins can do this. It's not one protein causing all these diseases. Lots of proteins can misfold. Lots of proteins can come together to form these sorts of structures. And this class of diseases is actually quite devastating, as you are probably aware. So this brings us back to Jeff Kelly. Now, Jeff Kelly had been studying uh, amyloid diseases for many years before I got into the lab. And he'd specifically been studying a class of amyloid diseases caused by a very specific protein called transthyretin, or TTR, which is how I'll call it from now on. TTR is a protein composed of four identical peptide chains, and it's in, in a conformation called a tetramer. And what that means is each one of these is its own polypeptide chain that comes together as four units becoming one thing, okay? That's what's called a tetramer of TTR. Now, this is a highly prevalent blood protein. So it's exported from cells, and it actually is in the blood at really high concentration. It's one of the most abundant proteins in the blood. And in the blood, its job is to take various nutrients like thyroxin and, and retinol throughout the body and deliver it to various other tissues that need it for function. You guys have probably heard of thyroxin, it's a small molecule. Retinol is, is, a, is another sort of molecule that's transported another type of protein. But effectively, it just takes nutrients throughout the blood. That's what it does. It's a transporter. Now, what's interesting about it is TTR forms amyloid in association with disease. And there are a lot of different diseases associated with amyloid or aggregates or clumps of TTR on various tissues. And this is really what Jeff studied. He wanted to understand how this tetramer, this protein, could actually cause disease. And so over the years, he worked out a really nice mechanism, him and, uh, him, him and others, uh, of how this actually worked. And the way it worked was really pretty cool. You have this tetramer. This tetramer basically falls apart. So instead of having four things into one big structure, you basically have monomers now. So you go from having four guys to a single guy. It falls apart. Once it falls apart, it misfolds very quickly to this, this aggregation prone conformation that could then aggregate and clump into these big toxic oligomer species. And, and this was all worked out over years, most of it working out in, in test tubes, in what's called in vitro studies, where he had purified transthyretin, and he could actually map it out by doing this sorts of various biochemical and biophysical assays. Now, the thing that was really cool about Jeff's lab, though, is he wanted to develop drugs that prevented this from happening. He wanted to develop drugs that basically stopped all of this aggregation, which is associated with disease. Now, to do that, what he really did was he found a way to basically bind to the tetramer with compounds, which are shown here in black, that prevent it from dissociating. And it was a really logical thing if you think about it, right? The worst thing that happens is this tetramer dissociates to this monomer. So it goes from four to one. And if you can stop that from happening, everything that happens after that won't happen either. And Jeff was really good at this. I mean, he had all kinds of different drugs that he was able to make out of this. One of them has actually been moved forward and now is being used to treat this disease. This is a drug called Tefamidus. Uh, it's also known as Vindiquel. What it does is it binds selectively to TTR, right at these two sites, right here, to prevent dissociation and aggregation. So it stops everything at the beginning, effectively. And this is now approved for treating TTR amyloid disease in Europe and Japan. It's currently undergoing FDA trials in the US. So he was really good at doing this. And to me, what I really liked about this was I could see Tefaminus, I could see this compound, and I could think, I can use organic chemistry and I can make this better. I can find Tefaminus 2.0 by changing all the different sort of things coming off of this compound. And that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to take this opportunity to use organic chemistry, make a better compound that could even be a better drug than this one. And that was what my PhD started off as. That's what I wanted to do when I started. However, sort of old problems came back, and it was pretty clear that this may not be the direction for me to move forward in. And, and as much as I loved organic chemistry, it was pretty clear that I, it really didn't love me in a lot of ways. I wasn't quite good at it uh, experimentally, and it wasn't something that I was going to be able to do long term. And this really became the end of my organic chemistry dream. However, when some dreams end, new dreams can come up. And what I did there is I really started to look at a different aspect of this problem, not looking at the development of new compounds, but instead actually looking at uh, other aspects of how this works. And what I really focused on for a lot of my PhD was a very simple question. How do these compounds actually influence this process? What makes them work? And I asked a variety of different sorts of, of questions using what's called in vitro assays, uh, where I took purified protein, I put it in a test tube, and I tested how it responds to various sorts of stimuli. And the types of question I asked was, how many of these different compounds are required? If I just find one, will it also work? I asked, 
what's the energetic factors that dictate this binding, and how does it actually stop everything downstream? So I really spent a lot of time doing that, and that was great, and, and it really allowed me to plug myself into a whole different type of biology and biochemistry that I had never done before. But that's not really what excited me most about my PhD career. What really got me excited is when I started asking a different question. And this is a question that came from a very simple idea, is what are the causes of TGRMO disease? Why, why do we get this in the first place? Why does this happen? Like, this shouldn't happen. Why, why does it happen? So to think about this, I've drawn this a slightly different way now, uh, where basically I, I can show the same dissociation of the tetramers uh, to monomers that then aggregate. Uh, but one thing I highlight here is that when you get aggregates, they can deposit on all types of tissues in the body. They can deposit on the heart, which is a cardi cardiac problem, or they can deposit on peripheral nerves, which is called a peripheral neuropathy. And I really wanted to understand why does TTR deposit in these different places? So it turns out that there are over 100 point mutations in the TTR sequence that are associated with disease. Now what that means is one amino acid in this 127 amino acid protein makes it cause disease. That's a crazy thing if you think about it, right? I mean, one amino acid, even a very subtle chain, something that's greasy to a little different type of greasy, can actually cause this disease. I found that to be amazing. And, and one of the things we were able to show is that the mutations, what they do, these single mutations, they destabilize the TTR tetramers and they increase aggregation in the blood. That's what they do. And, and honestly, that just blew my mind in a lot of ways because small, subtle changes have these huge effects. Now, got, what got really interesting to me was the fact that different mutations, they aggregate the same, but they cause different types of disease. And that's actually highlighted here by this, by this table where the wild type protein, which is the protein that most of us have, it actually causes disease. It deposits on the heart, and it causes a disease called cardiomyopathy. Okay? And that's found in 10 to 25% of males worldwide that are over 60 years of age. So think about that. That's a huge population having this type of disease. Now there's another mutation where you take this one type of amino acid, which is greasy, and you put it into a different type of amino acid that's slightly different, but greasy as well. And it causes heart disease as well. In this case, it actually is really high penetrance and causes a disease in 65 years of age or so. And this is a very, very bad disease, and it's found in a huge population of, of particularly African Americans. Now, the other type of disease was actually a different one, where again, you take a greasy, greasy amino acid, you mis, misplace it for another greasy amino acid, this deposits on nerves, and it causes peripheral neuropathy. Now, this disease itself was crazy when you think about it, because sometimes it happened very early, 30 years of age, you get the disease. Sometimes it happened late, 60 years of, of, of age, you get disease. And it was, it was just this wide range of different types of disease you got from this one mutation. So clearly there were a lot of other factors associated with this. And the thing I really got interested in about was what are the other factors that are so associated with disease pathogenesis or how the disease progresses. And this was something I found to be really interesting uh, for a lot of reasons. And it's something that really frames, even to this day, how I think about um, these sorts of disorders. So of this question, the one that really spoke out to me was, was a very specific one. It was, how do these proteins get into the blood in the first place? Like, what role do cells, for example, have in getting these proteins out in the blood? Now, to think about this, we again have to take a quick step back to ask how are proteins put outside of the cell? Um, and they're mostly done through a process that involves this one organelle within the body called the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER. The ER is actually what is the first organelle of the secretory pathway, which means it's the first step for any protein that gets outside of the cell. So the way it works is really pretty simple. Don't worry about all the details, but basically proteins get pumped directly into the ER itself. Once in the ER, they can fold into little curly cues or whatever structures they have, and then they get put in little what are called vesicles, which are basically little compartments that then get trafficked through other compartments in the cell than outside of the cell. So it can go from being inside the ER to outside the cell through this mechanism. Now, if proteins can't adopt this curly cue conformation or structure, they get recognized, they get removed from the ER, and they get degraded, so cut up. And it's a very simple process where proteins are folded and trafficked like to the extracellular environments, or they're removed. And it's a partitioning between these two that dictates what proteins get out and what proteins don't. And this is actually a process referred to as ER quality control. And much like other quality control pathways, the job is very simple. You want to make sure that you don't get proteins that are aggregation prone outside of the cell. And you want to make sure that the proteins that do get out are properly folded and will be stable and won't cause problems when they get outside the cell. And there are two main factors that dictate this. The first is the stability of the protein, which basically means how good it can go from being an unfolded thing to a folded thing. That's the efficiency of folding. That's how fast it can fold. And that's inherent to the polypeptide sequence. 
So what this means, though, is that stable proteins are the ones that fold very efficiently. They get outside the cell. Unstable proteins that don't fold efficiently, they get degraded. Now, the other factor that matters is actually a little more complicated, but it involves the activity of a variety of different pathways in the ER itself. These are pathways involved in helping proteins go from unfolded to folded. These are called folding pathways. This is involved in proteins that help proteins that are folded get trafficked through these sort of vesicles or these sort of compartments. And it also involves proteins that help recognize proteins that are not going to fold properly and help removing them, the degradation pathways. So there are components that work in all these different steps. And all these different components, their activity matters. So if you have more, like these folding pathway components, basically you end up folding proteins more efficiently and helping get them out of the cell. If you have more of these degradation factors, you actually have the opposite effect, where now they're being removed more efficiently. So effectively, you need to worry about how easily a protein itself can get to this folded conformation and all the different helpers there that help it go to that folded conformation. So again, the goal of the ER quality control pathway was simple. It's designed to prevent secretion of proteins that can cause problems. It's designed to prevent those sorts of proteins from being outside the cell. But then you have to think about that for a second, and you think, wait a second here. If that's true, how do amyloid disease happen in the first place? Because what I said was, these proteins that are really prone to aggregation, they get outside the cell. They can then aggregate into the, these, these clumps that cause disease. And then they get deposited on a lot of different tissues in the body. How are they getting out in the first place? Why are these, these mutations of TTR being secreted at all? They shouldn't be. We should be recognizing them earlier on. And this really became uh, something that I found to be a, a very fascinating question. And I spent the last year and a half or so of my graduate career really asking this question and how this is happening and what this means in the context of disease. So the way we did it was actually um, pretty simple. Uh, uh, there's a postdoc in the lab named Yoshi Sakajima and myself. And what we did is we took a series of different TTR mutations, about 30 of them. I'm only showing a few of them here. We measured their stability using in vitro technique. How efficiently do they fold? And the other side, we looked at secretion how efficiently they're put out of the cell. And what we found was really interesting. But one thing I want to highlight here is if you think about stability, uh, which is shown here, which again is how efficiently the protein folds, it's inversely proportional to aggregation. So in other words, the proteins that are least stable, they aggregate the most, and they're the worst types of aggregates. So they're the ones that should cause the worst type of disease. The ones that are actually quite stable, they should cause the least type of disease. So in other words, the ones over here are very bad, the ones over here are very, are, are, should be OK. And what we found was pretty interesting, in my opinion, that basically these really destabilized, really aggregation-prone proteins, they weren't secreted very well. They weren't put outside of the cell very efficiently. In other words, they had very low concentrations in the blood. And what that means was that the ER quality control pathway, they recognized these proteins. They recognized them as being bad, and they didn't let them be secreted. However, more stable proteins that are still aggregation-prone are secreted very efficiently, which means they have high concentrations in the blood which means there's a lot of them around that can aggregate into toxic clumps and then deposit. So what ends up happening here is that these mutations are the ones that cause very severe disease. And these are the ones that are escaping this sterile quality control mechanism to get outside of the cell. So they basically bypassed our surveillance. They, they, they hid in some way where they got outside of the cell where they could then cause the disease. And in fact, what it means is that we're protecting ourselves from these really bad ones, these really bad, these bad mutations. We're protecting ourselves from those. However, these less bad ones, but still bad enough to cause disorders, are the ones that cause these really severe diseases. And this disease in particular, the one caused by this specific mutation, basically starts at 30 years of age, and it progresses very quickly. And people have heart failure and peripheral neuropathy that lasts uh, not very long before they pass away. So really, it indicates that there's a clear link between what's going on in the ER and what's happening outside the cell. Shown a different way, it really means that the decisions being done here dictate exactly what's going on out here. And that was something that was really interesting. And in fact, since this work was published, other groups have gone on to show the same thing happens in multiple different types of amyloid diseases. The decisions that happen here actually affect what go on out there. And this was a really different way of thinking about these diseases. Traditionally, these diseases were always thought about where you see the toxic clumps. So if you see toxic clumps on the heart, it's a heart problem. If you see toxic clumps on nerves, it's a nerve problem. What this is saying now is, Wait a second, maybe it's actually where the protein is being made. For TTR, that's the liver. TTR is made in the liver. And maybe the problem isn't at the heart, it actually is in the liver. That's where the issue actually starts. I thought that was really a cool idea, and I really got excited about this role of what the ER is doing in these diseases. And I thought that was something that I really wanted to continue to pursue uh, as I continued my education. Now, I was quite lucky. 
I, I was able to get through my graduate work pretty quickly. It wasn't three and a half years. It was much closer to four, but nonetheless. Uh, basically, we, we uh, um, uh, were able to get a lot of work done over this short period of time. And it was really a transformative period of my life where now I went from being an organic chemist to being something more than organic chemist. I'm studying cells. I'm studying biophysics. I'm studying all these different properties of proteins. Completely different than what I went into. And honestly, it all came from back from one very simple thing. I followed my curiosity. And I was in a, an environment where Jeff was there that actually helped me do this. He gave me the confidence I needed to actually do this. But I tell you all, there's nothing better than following your curiosity. You're going to start in some aspect of science, and you're going to have questions that go to a different aspect. Don't be limited. Don't be limited by what you know. Go learn new things by following your curiosity. So at this stage, uh, I was now going to start looking for postdoctoral positions. Now, for anybody that's aware, that's the next step, typically, for people looking for uh, careers in science. You go do more training uh, in what's called a postdoc. It's kind of the equivalent of residency for MDs, where effectively you go do additional training where you don't get a degree from it, but you learn a new type of science, you learn a new type of training that's going to help you as you move forward with your career. Now, for me, uh, that means you have to pick sort of a topic. You have to sort of decide what you want to work on. And for me, the thing that was really fascinating to me was this idea about ER quality control. How are decisions made here that can affect disease states? And I really got really curious about how we normally deal with this problem. We are constantly challenging our ER function and through a lot of different mechanisms, but we must have ways to regulate it. We must have ways to protect the ER under different sorts of conditions. And that was really the question I got really excited about. How do cells regulate ER quality control? Now, unlike grad school, where you pick an institution to go do your grad work, when you do a postdoc, you pick a lab. So you don't apply like, like the same way you do for college and, and graduate studies. You apply to a specific person in a specific lab, and you ask, can I come to work with you in this field? Now, for me, it became very clear that, that the lab I wanted to work at was at NYU Medical School. And the reason why is because there's a man named, named, who, named David Ron who was doing really just amazing work looking at ER quality control and how cells protect themselves from various sorts of insults. Now, to talk about David's work and the work that was done in his lab, I need to first explain to you what stress is, or like what I think about stress. It, it really is about protein folding stress, and that's a very specific type of stress. So let me explain just briefly what that means. So it turns out that we are normally in a environmental sort of homeostasis effectively, which means that when it comes to protein folding, we have a certain amount of protein that need to be folded, that's the load, and we have a certain capacity. That's all the different pathways that help proteins fold. And the load and the capacity are always balanced. However, we're constantly encountering all different types of environmental stimuli. Some of you guys just had burritos, for example, so you eat all the time, right? Other times you have uh, of heat when you get hot. Other times you have mutations in your genome that cause problems. What these things do is they actually tilt that. And they mean that you have more load than you have capacity. This is happening all the time in our bodies. All the time this is happening. And what we have to do is we have to have ways where we can convert this imbalance back to this balance. Now, put a different way, we can actually show this uh, a slightly different way in how we deal with this problem. This is now looking at a different rendition of what the uh, um, central dogma is. You have DNA transcribed to RNA. RNA is translated to polypeptides. Those polypeptides have to fold. However, polypeptide folding, we now know, is not perfect. It can be competed with by misfolding, or aggregation, or premature degradation. All those things are competing with the proper folding, right? That's happening all the time. The problem is, how do we promote the proper folding and prevent these off-pathway things from happening? And as I mentioned briefly before, we have factors that work at every one of these steps. We have factors that take misfolded things and put them back to unfolded so they can fold properly. We have factors that, that dissociate aggregates to make an unfolded protein that can fold properly. We have factors that can remove proteins that are never going to fold properly because they're damaged in some way uh, through degradation. All these different factors, which are represented by these blue dots, help us to prevent going over here, and promote going over here. This is what we want, basically. OK, so then stress comes along. Stress comes along, what it actually does is it says, uh-oh, it's much easier now to go to misfold. It's much easier now to go to aggregates. So we have to have a way to respond to this. So we have to have a way to adapt this entire environment to say, I want to stop this from happening and restore going back to this way, proper folding. So the way that works is we basically change the blue dots. Some blue dots activity increases, some decreases. Some basically uh, is designed to help be more efficient at getting rid of things and help folding things and help their function. So basically, if you change the composition of these pathways and change the activity of these blue dots, you can alleviate this stress 
and you restore homeostasis. In other words, you now balance load to capacity. And so that's how we respond to all different types of stimuli. Now it turns out we have a lot of different pathways in our body that do exactly this. They basically take these different uh, insults and they, they recognize them and they say, I need to adapt a very specific way to this type of stress. And these pathways are localized everywhere throughout the cell. They're in the cytosol, called the heat shock response. They're in the endoplasmic reticulum, which is the, the organ that we talked about, called the unfolded protein response. And they're in mitochondria, which is called the mitochondria unfolded protein response. And all these pathways work in basically the same way. They say there's a problem in this environment, whichever compartment it is, and they tell the nucleus where the genetic information is to say, make a bunch of blue factors that can come back and help us. That's what they do. And these are basically called stress responsive signaling pathways, because they, they respond to stress. They respond to different types of stress, and they integrate their output to help the cells survive in response to these insults. Now, one thing I want to highlight is that these are all these signaling pathways, and they all work in generally the same way. I thought I'd introduce to you just briefly uh, how these signaling pathways actually work. These signaling pathways allow cells to adapt to specific cues, and they have three different sorts of factors in, in their activity. The first, if you think about the anatomy of these pathways, is the receptor or the receiver. This is the thing that says, I recognize this stress. Whatever that might be, I recognize what it is, and I'm going to basically convert that stress into information that can be transmitted. That can be happening a lot of different ways, but you basically recognize the stress and you start transmitting it. Then you have a bunch of signal transducers that basically take that stress and do all kinds of things to it. They can just carry it through different environments. They can amplify the stress if necessary. So one molecule can now become a signal of 15 molecules. And effectively, you can amplify the signal and you can actually get it to the point where now you recognize the stress and you're integrating with all the other different pathways that are happening in response to that same cue. And lastly, you need something called effectors. These are the ones that actually do something. In some cases, this means going into the nucleus and telling a bunch of other genes to come on. In other words, start making the proteins I need to help me. Start making the blue dots I need to help me in this response to this type of stress specifically. And that's really how all these pathways work. And there's lots of complexity in, uh, associated with this, but this is the basics of every stress response specific pathway. So that's how all of these work, and this is something that, that um, I was really excited about. And David and Purcell was, was well known in the field for doing this sort of work, studying these sorts of processes, and I was just mesmerized by this. And in particular, he did a lot of work looking at the unfolded protein response. Now this is a complicated slide, and I appreciate that, but I want, the one thing I want you to take home from this is that the unfolded protein response is not really one pathway, it's actually three. And they sit downstream of these three stress sensors, IRV1, PERC, and ATF6. And what they do is basically two things. They activate a bunch of genes. These are basically the blue dots that come back and protect protein environments from protein folding stress. And they also reduce translation. And I'll explain why that's important in a second, but I really want to highlight not necessarily uh, um, um, what they do at this point, but more about how you figure out these signaling pathways. How do you figure out the three different components of any of these signaling pathways? What's the process for that? So to do that, I thought we'd focus on one pathway, and I sort of take you through traditionally how these sorts of pathways are identified and characterized. And I thought that'd be kind of interesting because it really shows you a different type of science than I've talked about before. This is stress signaling biology now. This is stress signaling pathways. And the same approach I'll describe for this arm of the UPR will be the same you use for almost all different types of stress signaling pathways. Okay. So this is the pathway we're going to look at. It's actually all worked out here, but imagine that we didn't know any of this. We had to figure out how this pathway worked. How are all these different components coming together? So the first thing you have to do is you have to figure out what does it mean when the pathway is on. You need to establish some sort of a reporter for this pathway. Something that says, if this happens, this pathway is on. So here's an example of this. This is actually looking at a small little C. elegans, which is a small little roundworm that basically is really valuable for mapping stress pathways like this. And what ends up happening is this pathway responds to ER stress, which is a very specific type of stress in the cell. And when you add ER stress, you can watch this little worm, which is actually here, it's difficult to see, but it's here. When you add the ER stress, this worm turns, basically it, it lights up. That means our pathway is on. So now we know how to measure whether this pathway is on. How do we now figure out what's important for turning this pathway on? So one way to do this is you use genetics, basically. So to identify these components of these pathways, the receivers, the transducers, the effectors, what you do is you basically go through cells or worms or whatever system you're working with, and you just get rid of stuff. So for example, you can get rid of all kinds of different things inside these, these systems and ask, what turns off the reporter? So in this case, this is actually taking uh, um, worms now that, that are lacking this upstream guy, this IRE1 fella at the top here. 
right? So we just got rid of that. And what you can see now is, look, this comes on when you have ER stress in the wild type, which is the, the normal worm. If you take away IRV1, you don't see it come on anymore. That means IRV1 is required for this pathway to come on. And you can do the exact same thing to map the other pathways. You can show that this, this, this mRNA of XPP1 is required for this process, and you can show that, that any other component involved in this is required by just taking them away one by one. This is the general way that you find the components of a pathway. Then you have to figure out how these pathways work. How is stress actually transmitted? Now, this is a little bit more complicated. It usually requires understanding what the components are first. So in this case, it's been shown before that IRV1 is known to be required and XPP1 is known to be required, okay? So IRV1 itself encodes this unique endoribonuclease, which means it cuts very specifically mRNA. It cuts it really, really well and very specifically. And it turns out the sites are in XPP1 the mRNA for XPP1. And what ends up happening is, through a lot of biochemical and a lot of like, cell biological experiments, they're able to show that this part of IRV1 is involved in more or less cutting up pieces of this one mRNA to put them back together in a different way. And that different mRNA encodes the protein that's actually functional. So this was done over years and years and years, and it's difficult to actually show in a short talk, but effectively, they do a lot of biochemistry, they do a lot of cell biology to ask, how does this and this come together and intersect each other? Now, I don't expect you to remember how that works, but I want you to realize that, that this is where a lot of the work actually comes with this. You can identify components pretty quickly, but how those components talk to each other is really one of the biggest challenges in mapping these sorts of pathways. So we can now figure out how all these things talk to each other over years and years and years. Uh, and then the last thing we really need to know is, what's the output of the pathway? And the reason why this is the last step and not the first step is because you can't really define the output until you know how everything else works. In other words, you have to be able to, you could add ER stress, for example, and ask how does this, what comes on, what behaves like this protein. But effectively, you need to know how to stop it to really confirm that it's being selective. And in this case, when I say output, I mean what are all the different blue dots regulated by the end, at the end of this pathway? This is the effector, all the different things it does to the cell, what are those? And that really is something that's quite valuable because that's how you get to function. So the same exact approach has been applied for every arm of the UPR. Some of them have been done in slightly different ways, but that really is the way, main way that you work to figure this out. So then the next question really becomes, what does it do? What is it good for? We know how it signals, and we know what it actually makes at the end, but what does it actually do to the cell? Now it turns out that, that what the, ER, uh, the e unfolded protein response actually does is it functions to take this ER stress state where you have unbalance and folding load and folding capacity, and you can restore it by basically activating this pathway. So its main job is to take this imbalance and restore it back to homeostasis. That's what it does. And it's got two main ways that it does this. This is now looking at a little more complicated version of this, but, but the same principles apply. This is now just showing the UPR itself on the bottom here and what they do. Now the two ways that it does it is it, it regulates ER quality control. And the first way it does it is through activation of this PERC pathway, which what it does is actually reduces the load of proteins entering into the ER. So I mentioned before that PERC stops translation, which is actually the step of making proteins. And what ends up happening is you get less proteins coming into the ER when you activate this pathway. And what that means is less load means that the capacity you have goes farther. Now the other thing that happens is the IRV1 and ATF6 arms of the UPR completely remodel what's going on in these ER quality control pathways. These are the blue dots involved in protein folding, protein degradation. They completely remodel those through unique ways. And what that ends up doing is you increase capacity. So effectively, you're taking the ER, you're basically reducing the load, and you're increasing capacity. And that's how you restore homeostasis after it gets disrupted by ER stress. Now, um, I hope you can appreciate the fact that this seems like it should be fairly, a fairly important pathway. And in fact, it really is. Imbalances and failure of UPR signaling are associated with many different types of diseases. Neurogenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It's involved in diabetes. It's involved in heart disease. So when you have failures of the UPR, it really links to severe pathologic outcomes. Second, uh, the UPR itself is also sort of a fail-safe. So if you can't restore homeostasis after activation of the UPR, you basically end up killing the cells. And the reason why you want to be able to do this is because you want to be able to link ER function to cell fate. And the reason why is because the ER takes proteins and puts them outside of the cell. Those proteins can go do other things, right? They have functions, but they can also be toxic and cause toxicity. So if a cell cannot protect itself, if it cannot rescue the ER after these sorts of imbalances, then it needs to actually undergo apoptosis and cell death. So it's sort of a way to link 
ER quality control is itself failed. If ER quality control can't be rescued, that cell cannot go on producing these proteins. Um, and it really highlights the importance of this one pathway in regulating ER function. So during my postdoctoral training, it was a great experience for me. And really what it came down to is it gave me an opportunity to try something new. And I have to tell you that, that for me, this was really, really important. This is the first time I really started to look at things from a different perspective, from a cell biological perspective, from a, from a, a, a more genetics perspective. And this was essential for me moving forward. I now could really clearly see what I wanted to do as I moved forward. So now I'm more or less done with my training. I got my undergraduate degree in chemistry. I got my PhD from Scripps working in the field of chemistry more or less. And I've now gotten postdoctoral training in cell biology and genetics. Now, as my, my mom loved to tell me, it was time to get a job. Now, um, it turns out there's lots of different types of jobs you can get in a career in science. And I, I think this is something that, that every one of you should really appreciate, that not everybody has to go on to be professors. And in fact, that's not really suited for everybody. Some people want a different sort of career path. And that's great. And I think you should all be aware of this. And it's something that at Scripps, we do a really good job of, of highlighting to all the graduate students, that we think it's really important to understand that there are lots of career paths associated with this. Now, the one that you're probably most familiar with is the academic sciences. And it turns out that this is the professors. This is people like me and other sorts of professors you'll interact with as undergrads. But even within that, there are different types. There are the research uh, professors at research universities like Scripps, MIT, Berkeley. Uh, these are the ones that tend to be running a lab. They teach some as well, but they tend to run a big lab that's really research focused. There are professors at liberal arts colleges. These are the professors that love to teach, and they also run a lab as well with undergraduates mostly. But they have this really sort of unique role of, of helping to foster uh, undergraduates and become scientists. And it's a really uh, unique sort of profession. And, and I have a lot of friends in those positions that just absolutely love it. You could also not go into academic science. You could go into industry. You could work for biotech companies. You could work for big pharma companies doing the same sort of biology and the same sort of uh, work you've done as, as you, throughout your career as a way to facilitate drug development or other sorts of technology development. And even outside of research, there's other types of jobs you could have. You can be a consultant. These are really important jobs where basically you have to go and provide scientific insights into business decisions and the like. You can be medical science liaisons where you work with companies and, and scientists as sort of a, a intermediary to help convey information from the companies and their technologies to help scientific endeavor. You can be patent lawyers, which is actually a critical job for all these sorts of uh, um, uh, development of therapeutics and, and, and treatments. Uh, we need scientists that are lawyers that actually can be able to convert our scientific discussions into actual patents. And there are many other types of, disease, uh, types of um, um, uh, careers you can pursue in this sort of way. And for me, I thought that was a really important thing to, to highlight because uh, there really is a career in science for everybody if you want to do it. Now, admittedly, uh, I did take the easy route. I just didn't turn. I knew I wanted to be a professor, and I knew I wanted to be a professor at a research institution. I wanted to run a research program, a research lab, uh, that, that basically was able to ask important questions in unique ways. And I was really fortunate. I got hired back to Scripps. Uh, and, and it was absolutely fantastic for me. Scripps is the best place for me. However, there's a problem. When you get a job, you kind of have to have an idea. And so you need to be able to what's established what's called a research program. That's basically, what type of work are you going to do? What are you going to contribute to the community? Now, for me, I really kind of looked backwards to look forward in a way. I thought about my graduate training. I learned a lot about how ER quality control fa failure contributes to human disease. As a postdoc, I learned how cells regulate ER quality control through the unfolded protein response. So it seemed quite logical to me that I should integrate these two things to, to make a research program focused on UPR-dependent regulation of ER quality control and ask important questions thinking about all the different training that I've had and integrating those into asking what I think are um, potentially uh, new, new tr treatments for diseases like the amyloid disease. So the I became pretty simple. As a graduate student, I showed that what goes on in the ER actually affects amyloid diseases, right? And then I also showed at the postdoc that what goes on in the ER is regulated by the UPR itself. So it seemed pretty logical to me that maybe I could actually hijack the UPR for amyloid diseases. Maybe I could actually take the advantage of the fact that these pathways remodel this environment that I know is associated with disease. I know that the problem is in the ER. And maybe I could train the cell to recognize these proteins that get out before they even get out. And it helped them be degraded so that it lowers aggregate load and lowers disease path uh, pathology. The idea was simple. I wanted to basically help the ER recognize these proteins as being bad. That was the goal. And I thought, what better way to do it than to hijack the, the, the system that we already use for this, the unfolded protein response. 
So what we did is we developed a lot of different ways to activate these different arms of the unfolded protein response. I'm gonna show you a little bit of data, so bear with me. Uh, basically now, I'm looking at secretion of one of these amylogenic proteins, uh, when you, when you, uh, of destabilized TTR, I should say, when you activate the different arms of the UPR. So the red is one arm, the blue is another arm, and the green is actually the combination of the two. And what I found was activating one arm of the UPR, this ATF6 arm, the one arm that I haven't spoken about yet, is actually really good at reducing secretion of this destabilized protein. What's more, activating that one arm of the UPR, that one ATF6 arm, was really good at reducing the aggregates associated with disease. This is actually looking outside the cell. These are actually the aggregates associated with disease, and you can see that activating ATF6 reduced them by over half. Now this was actually pretty exciting to us, because we were able to show that activating ATF6, this one arm of the UPR, this one pathway, we could remodel the ER in such a way to reduce secretion and aggregate load extracellular. And that was really cool, um, but I got a little greedy. I thought, well, we're not targeting the protein. I'm not targeting TTR for any reason. That's the protein I used here, but I wasn't targeting it. So maybe the same thing could work for other types of proteins that cause disease. Maybe this isn't limited to just this type of disease. Maybe many others could do the same thing. So we showed this with TTR in a lot of papers. Uh, we also showed the exact same thing looking at a different, paper, the different amylogenic protein called light chain. These are actually parts of antibodies that can get secreted and cause a similar disease, a similar amyloid disease to TTR. We could reduce their secretion and we could reduce their aggregation in disease. And other groups showed that there are other proteins that aggregate, we could reduce their secretion and, and disease. In this case, this is mutant uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin and rhodopsin, which causes retinal degeneration. So it wasn't one protein. We basically trained the cell to recognize these proteins as being bad before they got out. Now what's interesting about this is we activated ATF6 and we asked, what happens to the rest of the proteins being secreted? Are we just reducing everything? And the answer was no. Only the bad proteins, the ones that cause disease, were the ones we were preventing from getting out and preventing from aggregating, which was actually incredibly exciting to us, because what that means is we weren't affecting everything else. And because of that, that really suggested that activating ATF6 could be a therapeutic strategy to treat a whole class of diseases. And now, in this case, I'm not talking about what Jeff did, where he targeted one protein I'm targeting the system, and by targeting the system, one drug potentially could be used to treat many different types of diseases, which would be really exciting for us uh, as we move forward. So the idea was really simple. I know that if I can get activation of this one arm of the UPR, this one pathway, I can get benefits. So the challenge became, how can I activate this one pathway? And it turns out this is not trivial uh, for a lot of reasons. It's not a trivial thing to think about, uh, and it turns out that that is actually very complicated. And you need a chemist to really think like this. You need to think like a chemist. And by this point, I drifted so far away from chemistry, I had to go get some help. I needed to find a chemist that could help me. And luckily, I could turn to an old friend, an old mentor, and Jeff, and we could work together, now in 2016, to do the same thing. And we were able to go find these compounds. And we did it in a really fun way. We did what's called high-throughput screening. And I won't go through all the details, but I'll say that we defined a platform that allowed us to screen 650,000 compounds. We have no idea what they are. Well, technically we know, but, but we don't care what they are. It's a huge library of 650,000 compounds. We then developed different ways where we could ask, do they activate the arm of the UPR we care about, the ATF6 arm, which was yes. Then we asked, do they actually activate the other arms of the UPR that we don't want to come on? If they said yes, we got rid of those and we moved on. And then we could even ask very cleanly which pathways are actually coming on and can we show this very selectively? Now, from this, we were able to identify a set of ATF6 activating compounds. These are compounds that turned on ATF6 very specifically, but not the rest of the unfolded protein response, which is exactly what we wanted for further development. And in fact, we were able to show at this point that, that we had this compound, we could activate this one arm of the UPR, and we can use all this for modeling, and then we wanted to know, could we get the same result we got when we use other approaches to activate ATF6? And the short answer is yes. We could show that we could reduce secretion of destabilized transthyrins, when we use some of these compounds, 147 and 263, which are cleverly named, we could reduce secretion of the mutant disease-associated variants, but not the wild-type protein, meaning that we're not globally affecting everything. We're just training the cell to recognize these bad proteins. And the same compounds do not have any effect on the rest of the proteins being secreted. We're just affecting the bad proteins. We've now gotten this result with TTR. We've got the same result with light chain, and we're now testing these other ones as well. But really, it indicates that we can now have a drug, effectively, to activate ATF6 and be beneficial uh, for treating these sorts of diseases. And really, it indicates that ATF6 is a potential therapeutic approach to treat this whole class of disorders, and it's something we're really excited about. 
We think there's a lot of potential here moving forward for further drug development. That's something we're actively doing now. So I, I am uh, really excited about the fact that I'm able to integrate these two ideas and really come up with a new sort of a, 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 a product out of it by focused on these two different aspects of my training. And that really becomes one of the last lessons is that when you start your own work, whenever what you do, you can integrate what you know to ask important questions. The important question here was, how do we treat these sorts of diseases? And I integrated both my understanding of how the disease happens with my understanding of how you can control ER function to find a new potential strategy. Now, whether this works or not, we're years away from knowing. But it really does suggest there's a new opportunity to move forward and something that I'm actually uh, quite excited about. So um, I want to sort of highlight something here, that these are the lessons that I've highlighted throughout this uh, um, talk so far. Research experience is invaluable. It's one thing to read about it, doing it's a whole other thing. And for me, that was transformative. Follow your curiosity. If you have interesting questions or you have new questions, ask them. The more you ask questions, the more curious you are, the more likely you to find a path that's going to be really suitable to you to move forward. And as you follow your curiosity, don't forget to try something new. Don't be hamstrung by the fact that you only know a certain type of science. Always be pushing forward. And then, you know, make sure you always think back, though, and integrate what you know to ask important questions. And the last lesson, which is one that I, I hope is, is something that I'm still continuing, is never stop learning. Last thing I'd like to really end with is this point that science has given me a lot. I grew up in West Virginia, and honestly, I never thought I'd be traveling the world like I do now. And I've met so many mentors and colleagues and friends along the way. In particular, I really want to highlight the three people that really took chances on me. None of them had to. And in fact, in a lot of ways, none of them probably should have. But they all did. And I'm always going to be grateful for this. Professor Escorn, as an undergrad, letting me into a lab was something that was really just the most important thing for my whole career. Jeff really helped me through my graduate career. I mean, honestly, he still works with me now, and he's still a mentor to me. And David's lab was just a phenomenal time for me where I got to learn new type of sciences. I got to actually really experience a different type of work working with an absolute leader in that field. And, and there was nothing better than that. But I will say, as many friends and colleagues I've had the way, my, my, my favorite part of my job now is not any of the science, actually. It, it's the opportunity to work with some really great people. Now, this is people from my lab throughout the years. I've had an opportunity to work with some of the smartest people, and it's been just so much fun for me. Some of them now have their own labs at MIT, at Vanderbilt, at Trinity University. They basically are all over the country now uh, working in their own sorts of things, and there's nothing more rewarding to me than that. And for me, to this day, this is the thing I enjoy the most. And I really am appreciative for all of their hard work and everything they do.